Okay, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, today, uh, it's a pleasure to have Onkar Parikar from Stanford, who is going to tell us about building tensor networks for holographic states. Onkar, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to um, to speak uh, at AEI and University of Warsaw, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so today, I wanted to um, tell you about um, oh, oops. Uh, this paper um, that came out on the archive a, a few months back with Pavel Sapuda and uh, Jorrit Krutov, um, which is about um, trying to, to, to um, give a, a somewhat more precise construction for, um, for tensor networks uh, in holographic states. Um, so let me begin with uh, some background. Um, so it's, it has long been suggested um, that the emergence of the radial direction in ADS-CFT is, is some form of a, a holographic uh, renormalization group. Um, basically, the, the, uh, one thinks of the radial direction of uh, the, the emergent ADS space as some kind of an RG direction um, flowing from the UV, which is the asymptotic boundary, uh, in, towards the IR. Um, uh, but recently, more recently, um, uh, a somewhat more precise uh, proposal for how uh, this holographic RG works was um, was given uh, in, in these papers here. I hope you can see my uh, cursor, um, uh, which um, involves what is called the TT bar deformation of the boundary conformal field theory. Um, I'll, I'll explain what the TT bar deformation is and give some more details later on, but it's a particular irrelevant deformation of the, uh, of the UVCFT. And it's been suggested that um, of a, a certain flow along this TT bar deformation um, generates, uh, in some sense, the, the radial direction of ABS. Um, and there are several checks of this proposal, which I'll mention uh, as we go along. Now, on the other hand, um, there's a separate line of um, thought which suggests that we should think of the sort of emergent radial direction, at least on bulk Cauchy slices, in terms of um, uh, a tensor network, um, which is supposed to sort of encode the entanglement structure of the boundary CFT state. Um, in terms of some sort of a position space RG, uh, okay, uh, but this has more to do with the the tensor network description has more to do with the entanglement structure of the state and how um, that is organized um, in terms of some RG scheme. And at the face of it, on the face of it, it seems like these two um, these two different viewpoints on the emergence of the radial direction in ADS-CFT are somewhat different. Uh, but the purpose of this talk will be to take some steps towards uh, relating these two different perspectives. And in particular, our goal will be to um, use the recent developments in, in TT bar to uh, give a more or less, um, or to, to, to give it at least a road, roadmap for a, a precise construction of tensor networks um, for holographic states. Um, Okay, and what, what, one last thing I should say before we go to the details is that um, one of the nice features of tensor networks is that, um, you know, the entanglement entropy of boundary intervals um, satisfies a very natural bound uh, for tensor network states. Um, it's, um, you know, if you have a tensor network which prepares some state, then the entanglement entropy of some boundary interval here Shown in the shown like shown in the as the green segment um, is upper bounded by sort of a minimal cut through the bulk of the network um, um, uh, times some coefficient. That coefficient is often the is is the log of the sort of bond dimension or the sort of dimension of the Hilbert space that is ex exchanged along the the cuts uh, in the network. Um, and this this uh, sort of a, an upper bound. Even if it's not an equal, inequal, it's it's just an inequality, not an equality. But even so, it sort of reminds one of the um, you know the Ryutaka Inagi minimal area surface 
formula for holographic states. Um, and in fact, there are tensor networks one can construct where this bound can um, can be made in, into an equality. Um, 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 so, uh, th th so this is one of the features that one would want to uh, preserve of any tensor network that one wants to construct. And in particular, we 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 will argue later on that um, the the network that we get from a TT bar flow does satisfy a bound like this. And in fact, uh, it's a little bit better uh, in in that this coefficient um, happens to agree with one over four G Newton um, when you when you convert everything in terms of the bulk data. Okay, so that, um, that is where uh, we want to go. So a brief outline. Um, we'll start by with a brief review of TT bar um, and the proposed dual uh, with the cutoff ADS space. Um, then we'll uh, spell out some details of the construction of tensor networks using TT bar um, then I'll discuss the entanglement entropy of boundary intervals, uh, in particular the, the upper bound I just mentioned, um, and more details on that. Um, and then finally, I'll end with some uh, open questions and so Okay, so are, are there any questions at this stage? Yeah, I, I should have said, please feel free to just interrupt and ask questions at, at any point. Uh, Okay, so if not, then maybe I'll uh, I'll go ahead with um, with with the review of TT bar. Um, so the TT bar operator in two D quantum field theories is defined um, as this particular combination. Uh, T here is is the stress tensor, um, and the reason it's often just denoted with TT bar is that if you just evaluate this operator in 2D CFD, then one ends up with um, just the product of the holomorphic and the anti-holomorphic uh, uh, parts of the stress tensor. So that's why the notation TT bar. Um, now, um, when we say TT bar flow, what one means is that one has a, a one parameter, uh, a one parameter a family of theories or a flow in, in of theories where at every point along that flow, one deforms the, the field theory with the TT bar operator constructed from the stress tensor at that particular um, at that particular point along the flow. Okay, so for example, um, you, you, you can define the flow by writing an equation like this, where at, if the flow parameter is denoted by lambda, then then d lambda d by d lambda of the the action of the theory um, is is written in terms of the tt bar operator but note that i put a subscript lambda on the stress tensor here that's supposed to indicate that the at at parameter lambda the the, the operator that we deform by is the tt bar operator constructed from the stress tensor of the theory at the value lambda okay so that's um, that's how the TT bar um, flow is defined. Um, now that, that 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 that's how it's defined in the CFT. But uh, for our purposes, um, what's somewhat more important is that is the recent proposal by uh, McGuff, Maze, and Verlinde uh, that the TT bar deformed CFT is dual um, from the bulk perspective. Um, to putting a cutoff in ADS space, um, and the cutoff value in the in the radial direction uh, is given or is related to the TT bar coupling lambda um, in the dual CFT. Okay, so um, you flow the boundary CFT uh, with this TT bar flow that I just mentioned up to um, some value of the coupling lambda, uh, and that is conjectured to be dual uh, to putting a cutoff on the bulk ADS space um, at the value um, RC squared, which is given by two pi G Newton divided by uh, lambda. This L here is just the L ADS. You can set it to one if you want. We can, we'll, for the most part, we'll set this L to one uh, in the rest of the term. Okay, so that 
uh, was their proposal. And to be somewhat more precise, what one could do is one, one, uh, one takes the bulk geometry and writes it uh, in a Pfefferman gram form like this, um, where you're just to introduce some notation, this G with uh, superscript naught is the induced metric on the on the constant radial slice. Um, and let me also introduce some more notation while we are at it. Uh, we will write this induced metric uh, up to a conformal factor, this factor of R squared times gamma. This gamma here is going to be roughly the metric um, on which the, the dual the field theory lives. So it, it's roughly the background metric um, for the for the the effective field theory uh, dual to this cutoff ADS space. Um, uh, that's just notation. Um, but uh, the more precise proposal then is that uh, the gravitational action in, in this cutoff region of the bulk spacetime um, in the large G Newton limit is dual to the boundary partition function um, uh, of the TT bar deformed CFT with this particular value of the coupling uh, and the, this gamma being the um, the background metric for the for the for the boundary field theory okay so that was their proposal now there are some uh, checks and there's some evidence uh, for this conjecture um, first of all this the TT bar flow although it may seem like it's um, it's a bit uh, non-trivial. Uh, it has it has several nice properties, and one of the very nice properties that it has is that you can just explicitly work out how the energy levels um, of the boundary field theory flow uh, under this deformation. So, for example, if you imagine putting your boundary field theory on a circle, uh, a circle of length L, uh, this capital L here is the length of a boundary of the boundary circle on which the field theory lives, um, then you can just explicitly work out uh, a formula for how the energy levels flow. Um, so say the nth energy level here um, at the coupling lambda is given by this formula, where this E naught is the nth energy level or the, the same energy level in the original undeformed CFT. Um, and the J is the correspond J sub n is the corresponding angular momentum um, or the momentum in the in the circle direction. Uh, and of course, lambda, as I said, is the TT bar coupling. Okay, uh, so that's a pretty nice uh, formula. Um, and um, so one of the nice checks of this proposal by Mazay Magaf and uh, Verlinde is that um, is that the, these energy levels uh, precisely agree um, with um, and the quasi-local energies that you can compute using ADS CFT. So from the bulk perspective, what one does is one construct one thinks about these sort of one, you can construct a, a, a stress tensor at this cutoff slice uh, by using the um the Bal Silberman and Krauss formula, and then compute the energy or the quasi-local energy, if you like, uh, which you get uh, for a bulk black hole um and with some cutoff at um uh, at at a finite radial direction a ra radial coordinate and um then that formula for the quasi local energy precisely agrees with this formula um from for the t t, t the energy eigenvalues of the tt bar deformed field theory um once you uh, match this lambda um as per as per the original conjecture with the radial coordinate of the cutoff on the radio. Uh, what's a ward here? Say that again, sorry. What is a the coefficient a ward here? Is that a one? Related? Is this yeah. a one? Uh, the a one is yeah. uh, so uh, generally you have to add counter terms in this Balsubraman and Krauss formula. Um, so one, so the a one is just some coefficient with respect to which you you know the, the coefficient of the holographic RG counter term that you add on the on the boundary cutoff slice. Yeah, it's it's some fixed number. I I just didn't want to look it up. It's it's just a coefficient that you fix. Okay, is that clear? Okay, great. Thanks for that question. Any other questions? Yes, maybe um, as a clarification. So, sure. like here in the three-dimensional um, um, holographic setup, um, you you say the cutoff. Uh, 
uh, in, or is dual to the TT bar uh, um, identification. On the other uh, hand, in mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, in higher dimensions, I know that a cutoff um, in the holographic uh, coordinate uh, can cause like uh, a theory or um, mimic a theory with uh, confinement. So I'm wondering, um, um, yeah, is this uh, that then? Or do, do you have an idea why there's a difference between the, the dimensions in these very different interpretations of that? Um, I'm not very familiar with the, the confinement proposal that you're mentioning, but at least the, this, these, these checks um, that I'm, I was mentioning here are, uh, are very precise in two dimensions, or so ADS3 CFT2. Um, in, there, is, there is a proposal also uh, for a similar deformation in higher dimensions, which um, uh, which people have made for for a uh, for a radial cutoff in ADS. It uh, the proposal is again very similar to a TT bar deformation, but it's a little bit less under control because one really needs to work at large n um, in that case. Uh, in ADS three, the nice nice thing about this TT bar deformation is that uh, this formula, for instance, doesn't rely on large n. Uh, it's it's just a formula in the CFT. Um, uh, but yeah, unfortunately, I'm not very aware with the, of the thing that you were mentioning with this confinement proposal, so I probably shouldn't say anything. Uh, maybe we can discuss, come back to this question uh, later. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, wonderful. Um, so th that was one piece of evidence. Um, that I uh, for, for the for the proposal uh, uh, of the ADS cutoff space with TT bar. Um, the, the other piece of proposal the evidence is that is it, it comes from looking at the radial Wheeler Dewitt equation. Um, so the partition function of the um, dual uh, field theory, or uh, sort of a which one can think of as a as a radial uh, wave function from the bulk perspective satisfies this constraint equation, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, um, which just comes from, it's, it's just a, um, one of the Einstein's equations. Um, now, if you use the Balsabermann and Krauss formula again um, for uh, defining the boundary stress tensor on this uh, fixed radial slice, um, with the, as, as, you know, from this, this is this is the Balsabermann and Krauss formula, which relates the stress tensor to the extrinsic curvature. Now you take this and you plug it back in here uh, into the wheeler dewitt equation, and that um, what that gives you is that it it says that the, the trace of the stress tensor is equal to some coefficient times that this precisely the same operator, the TT bar operator, um, uh, and uh, the usual. Um, um, uh, uh, the anomaly and the, the trace anomaly. Okay. Um, now, if you further assume that there is only one dimensional scale in the theory uh, along this flow, which is which would be the case if you start with a, a CFT uh, at the asymptotic boundary and you flow inwards, then the only dimensional dimensional scale in the in the theory is the coupling lambda. Uh, and then, in that situation, you can you can argue that um, the the so the so a simple word identity sort of argument tells you that the change in the effective action of the theory is related to, to the trace of the stress tensor in that situation, um, and then comparing this, you you plugging in the formula for the trace of the stress tensor uh, here, um, and comparing with the you know definition of the TT bar deformation. Um, you we we again land land up on the same um, identification of lambda with uh, uh, basically this one half cancels with a two here and you you end up identifying lambda uh, with two pi g newton uh, over r squared. Okay, so this is the same identification that was made by McGuff, Mazzi, and Verlinde, and so this is this is one other way of um, of thinking about where that identification comes from or why the TT bar operator is relevant um, for um, a, a radial a radial flow uh, in ADS CFT. Okay, and um, I should probably uh, not uh, spend too much time on this. This is a quick aside. 
um, which is to say that you can also think from a field theory perspective, you can also think of uh, the TT bar flow um, in terms of the Hamiltonian as a Hamiltonian flow. Um, and what happens is that you find that it sort of neatly organizes uh, as a sum of two terms. There is this one term um, which you know just looks like a commutator of the Hamiltonian with something else. Uh, and so it's it's an it's it's a pretty nice term. It sort of if if the second term was absent, then this it, it would just say that the TT bar flow is um, is successively performing uh, canonical transformations or Bokolyubov transformations. Uh, but at least on a circle of finite length, there's another term. Um, but that other term is sort of um, what gives rise to the flow of the energy eigenvalues. Uh, it, it's a it. it the, the, the extra this extra term also organizes nicely it's factorized uh, in terms of these um, uh, charges of the dual field theory but in particular as l becomes large and if you restrict yourself to at least low energy states uh, then at large l this term becomes uh, less important and um, the theory the flow uh, really does look uh, like a successive Bogolyubov transformations uh, of the dual field theory Okay, this was uh, this was just an aside. Um, so let me now, uh, having having given you some evidence for the proposal for the TT bar uh, uh, and cutoff ADS correspondence, uh, let's now go go on to the main um, main uh, subject where we want to actually use this proposal to um, to to uh, to construct some tensor networks um, for for uh, holographic states. OK, um, so what we'll do is for the most part, we'll talk about ADS3. Uh, so what in Euclidean ADS3 in particular. Um, so what I have, what we have in mind is that in the dual CFT, we are talking about the vacuum state. Uh, but um, more generally, many of the arguments that will be given are, are more generally true of, um, you know, of holographic states and Euclidean uh, bulk space times with Time reflection symmetry. Okay, so that that is um, that is really the only constraint that I'll use for the most part. But for simplicity, let me um, let me just talk about Euclidean ADS three. Um, and so, okay, so what what we do is we um, uh, to begin with uh, something some we use we just uh, switch to a, um, a a different coordinate system. This is sort of trivial. Um, but you you introduce these. Um, let's say you you go to polar coordinates in the tau z plane. Tau here is the Euclidean time, and z is the usual Poincaré uh, z coordinate of ADS space. Okay, so you switch to uh, polar coordinates. Uh, let's say u and theta, and then uh, just for convenience, uh, redefine theta in this way in terms of another parameter w. Uh, and if you do that, then you find that you can rewrite the metric. Uh, like so, all right. Um, so uh, just to give you a picture, um, these, uh, these this W coordinate is related, as I said, to this angular coordinate um, here, right? Um, so um, now, what if you if you let uh, the the U coordinate here was related to the radial to the radial coordinate in this picture, but Having switched, having uh, having uh, come to this particular coordinate system, what you can do is you can just let u, uh, which was positive uh, originally, we can just let u uh, run from minus infinity to plus infinity. So let let it be real valued. And what that is is that um, if when u goes to minus infinity, we'll um, the sign of u will be will be related to uh, the sign of the Euclidean time direction. So so negative u is down here. And positive u is up here. Okay, so as u goes to minus infinity, we go down here, and then as u increases, we we go all the way to the asymptotic boundary. And as u is going positive and going becoming larger and larger, we are going off in this direction. Okay, so um, with with that uh, with that in mind, uh, with that convention in mind, uh, if you look at a constant w slice in this in this coordinate system, then that looks like this um, folded blue slice. Okay, this, um, this blue slice that is drawn in this picture. 
Um, now, if you if you work through these conventions, then as W goes to zero, this folded slice is sort of going off to the asymptotic boundary and opening up into the full um, boundary Euclidean path integral. As as W is becoming um, Sorry, that, yeah, that was W going to zero. As W becomes larger, this blue slice uh, folds into the bulk, okay? Um, and as W goes to one, uh, it sort of folds itself onto this time reflection symmetric slice in the bulk. That's, that's where W goes to one, uh, and that's where uh, we are going to stop this, this uh, W coordinate, okay? So the W coordinate just goes from zero to one. Um, okay, so that's just uh, um, that. I, that was just describing the coordinate system, uh, but now the basic idea is to regard this W coordinate, um, which is defined here, um, as the radial coordinate. Okay, as the new radial coordinate um, in my bulk theory. And if we if we now utilize this um, ADS cutoff CFT uh, cutoff ADS uh, TT bar uh, correspondence, then the idea would be to say that well, uh, if if I if I put a cutoff in this in this W coordinates, okay, then there must be some effective field theory that on living on sort of quote unquote living on this blue slice here or on the boundary of this wedge region. Um, uh, which is dual to the to the to the gravitational action or the the gravity theory in the in the wedge in in this uh, in this wedge region here. There's a better picture coming up. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so in in this gray shaded wedge region, um, the the gravitational theory in this in this region the, the wedge region should be dual to some effective field theory living on the the boundary of that region which is which is this blue slice um, and following the mmv conjecture it's natural to suppose that this this field theory on this blue slice is just um, a tt bar deformation uh, of the boundary field theory with uh, just following the previous um, discussion, the TT bar coupling will now be related to um, the, the, the value of this cutoff uh, radial coordinate W. Uh, earlier it was this radial coordinate R, but here we are putting a cutoff in this new coordinate W. And so the TT bar coupling is related to this um, value of the, the W coordinate uh, where we put a cutoff. And furthermore, uh, the, the background metric on which this effective field theory on the, this, uh, this folded slice lives is, that, is, is the one that you get from, naturally from um, this metric, uh, which happens to be a hyperbolic space. OK, um, that's just what you get. Uh, and so the proposal would be, uh, or uh, the, a natural conjecture would be that um, the you know, the gravitational theory in this uh, wedge region is dual to the TT bar theory, the TT bar deformed theory on this, uh, this blue folded slice with these values uh, for, for lambda and the background metric. Okay, now if, if, if one buys that, um, then, um, you know, uh, one comment I suppose is that the, the met, as I said, the metric on these folded slices is that of hyperbolic space. Um, and you know, these the similar slices, or at least um, one half of them, at least, for example, the lower half of this, this folded slice, uh, have these, ty these type of slices have appeared in previous literature um, in various places, but in particular on, on complexity in these papers or on the discussion on path integral optimization and so on. Uh, they often, people call them York time slices or uh, something like that. Um, and the point here is to so somehow uh, use this TT bar description to give a tensor network interpretation for, for these folded slices. Okay, so that's where we are uh, headed in the next couple of slides. Um, just one comment before you do that is that in order to avoid UV divergences uh, coming from uh, the small z region, remember the z, z is the usual Poincare coordinate going into the bulk. Um, so in order to avoid UV divergences, what we'll do is we'll always put 
um, a cutoff um, here at z equals epsilon. So in other words, the uh, the the asymptotic CFT lives um, on some cutoff at z equals epsilon. Uh, and for that reason, when you fold this uh, CFT into the bulk, um, you know, these folded slices uh, go off and meet this asymptotic cutoff at some point. Uh, and that means that you ha we, have, we have to include some, a, a, a tiny regulator strip um, uh, in this uh, in this on this folded slice, um, so this the u coordinate which I had defined, uh, you remember here the u coordinate which was like this Euclid was was like the Euclidean time coordinate on the folded slice. Okay, it goes uh, along the folded slice and it acts like the new Euclidean time. Um, so when the, that Euclidean time is within some tiny strip of um, with let's say b. Then that the, that region there is is just flat space. Okay, um, so that's just a regulator regulator strip that one must include to avoid UV divergences. But other than that Euclidean flat space strip, uh, the geometry of the rest of this folded slice is hyperbolic space. I have a question. Oh yes, please. Uh, on that regulator strip, is it the same theory, same T T bar deform theory that you put there, or is it the CFT? It's uh, so because this regulator slice is living at z equals epsilon, it's a TT bar deformed. So on the flat space strip, it's going to be a TT bar deformed theory uh, with a small TT bar coupling related to this epsilon. Okay, and but the point is is that the background metric will be flat space. Um, and on the rest of the on the on the rest of the slice, the coupling. Um, will be uh, related to this W squared and the background metric will be uh, the hyperbolic space metric. So they're flowed by different amounts on the strip versus the box. Yes. Okay. That's right. So the, the strip, you, I mean, at the end of the day, we are interested in taking the epsilon going to zero limit. So I usually think of the strip, the Euclidean strip CFT or field theory as in that limit as going to the, the, the true CF, the dual CFT. Uh, but the the field theory living on the folded part of the slice um, doesn't do that. That's just uh, an honestly TT bar deformed theory, even in the epsilon going to zero limit. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, great. So um, that um, that is as much uh, for uh, uh, for for the TT bar. Deformation. So now we want to use, as I said, our goal here is to give some interpretation in terms of tensor networks for these folded slices, or in particular, the lower half or one half of these folded slices. And so that's what we want to do next. Okay, so how do we do that? The crucial thing for that, of course, is the fact that this Euclidean space time has time reflection symmetry. Uh, as I said, that's the, that's the main constraint that we'll use throughout true of ADS3, of course. Um, now, um, so using that time reflection symmetry, we can take this uh, effective field theory or the, the partition function of the effective field theory, which lives on this folded slice, which I'm going to denote uh, as Z sub TT bar with these two parameters. The parameters are uh, how far we flowed into the bulk, this W coordinate and the background metric gamma. That is the the metric of hyperbolic the hyperbolic metric that we just discussed a little bit ago, uh, which uh, which is the induced metric sort of on the folded slice. Okay. Anyway, so we can take the partition function of this TT bar flow theory, and we can in interpret that that partition function as an overlap. Okay. This overlap is just um, the overlap between the the lower half. Um, portion of that path integral and the upper half portion of the path integral. So you could visualize the, the effective field theory path integral on this folded slice as uh, uh, the, the picture on the right here as a Euclidean path integral between something on the lower half, the, the lower half portion here uh, and something on the upper half portion. The lower half portion um, creates a state um, that I'm going to denote uh, with this, um, by putting uh, basically you know, the parameter WC and 
the induced metric gamma minus. Gamma minus is just saying the induced metric on the lower half space here. Um, so that defines a state, the Euclidean path integral of the CT bar deformed field theory um, with these particular parameters uh, defines some state. And similarly, the, um, the, the path integral up here on the upper half space defines um, a corresponding bra. Uh, and then of course, the, the full Euclidean path integral is the overlap between these two things, okay? Between the, the ket defined from the lower half space and the bra defined on the upper half space. Great. So, um, so then um, um, this, this particular state that is being defined here uh, using the Euclidean pass integral of the TT bar deformed field theory, um, we should interpret that state as, as a state living in the UV Hilbert space. Okay. The, the reason for this is that if you, if you look at um, what this path integral is doing, it's preparing a state at the asymptotic boundary. Okay, the, the, the state uh, here lives um, uh, in, in the left picture, lives at the asymptotic boundary uh, at tau equals zero. So it's a state that lives in the, uh, uh, the UV Hilbert space, the CFT Hilbert space, but it is prepared by a Euclidean path integral of the CT bar deformed field theory um, uh, on, 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 on the geometry of this folded slice. Sorry, so I thought you just told Gonzalo that uh, the Euclidean section was a slightly TT bar deformed theory. So why yeah, are you yeah. calling it a state of that slightly TT yeah. bar deformed yeah. theory? Yeah, sorry, I, I, that was a little bit uh, of a, yeah. So what I really meant was in the epsilon going to zero limit. So in oh, the- uh, Okay, I see. Yeah, in the epsilon going think to you could, I don't think you'd say that's probably equally good as you can imagine adiabatically flowing to the CFT from there. To the, sure. the right. that's, that's, that's a good point. Great point. Yeah. So sorry. Yeah. I, what I really meant to say here is, is that in the epsilon going to zero limit, one could interpret the state as living in the, in the dual CFT, but you're absolutely right with the cutoff present. It's, it's a state in this slightly flawed uh, theory. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Great. That's a good, uh, thanks for that, uh, that comment. Um, so with that understanding, um, we, we interpret the state as living um, in the UECFT Hilbert space, or at least close a, a state somewhat close um, to the UV, uh, to being in the UV uh, Hilbert space. Um, but it's prepared uh, with the Euclidean path integral of a TT bar deformed field theory on the geometry of this folded slice. Okay, so that, that, is, um, that is where we are. Uh, and so that so the proposal then is to think of of the, these states, these states which are prepared thusly, um, as a, a one parameter family of tensor networks. So it's a one parameter family. The parameter being this W C, uh, how how much you're folding the the path integral into the bulk. Um, now um, the the reason we call it a, a, ten, a continuous tensor network is that. Well, first of all, it has it has a description in terms of a Euclidean path integral. Okay, um, so the Euclidean path integral is not a discrete object; it's not a discrete tensor network, but one could interpret it as a continuous tensor network in the sense that um, it's prepared by successive uh, ac op su successive actions of the Euclidean time evolution operator e to the minus beta h. And if the Hamiltonian is sufficiently local, um, then you could um, you could imagine rewriting the Euclidean path integral um, as a sort of continuous tensor network. Okay, so that that is the usage of the word uh, continuous. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, just to emphasize here, we should note that the these tensor network states um, that we are describing are not uh, the CFT vacuum, okay? So these Euclidean path integrals on the folded slice, they don't prepare the, the CFT vacuum, but instead they're, they're preparing the, this, this path integral on the folded slice is preparing the vacuum of this TT bar deformed field theory, okay? Uh, and then embedding it into the UV Hilbert space. Uh, that, that's, that's the way, uh, that's one way to think about it. 
Um, and uh, I one one more comment is that um, is that if you if you think about the the length scale of non-locality uh, here, uh, the length scale of non-locality in the TT bar deformed field theory is is the square root of lambda, lambda being the TT bar coupling. Um, okay, that length scale of non-locality is of course much smaller than the ADS scale um, because if you if you write it in terms of WC and the central charge, it, it's suppressed with one over square root of C. Um, okay, but it's also much greater than L Planck, which is one over C. So the, the length scale of non-locality in this TT bar deformed field theory is somewhere in between these two length scales. Great. Um, in, since I'm a little bit low on time, I should probably uh, skip this slide and go ahead to um, now describing um, the entanglement structure uh, of these tensor networks. Okay, so as I said before in the earlier part of the talk, one of the main things that we want to do here is to, um, to argue that these tensor networks satisfy uh, uh, a, a bounds on the entanglement entropy of boundary intervals, uh, which are sort of, uh, which are uh, standard features of uh, tensor networks. Uh, and we want to check what the, the corresponding bond dimension is. Okay. Now, what we have in, in, in the present case is that we have Euclidean path undergrowth, right? The, 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 the tensor network description that we got for this, this slice, um, this folded slice was a Euclidean path integral and the TT bar deformed field theory. So what can we do with the Euclidean path integral? Well, for any Euclidean path integral, we can always given some some boundary region R in the in the uh, in the in the con at, a, at tau equals zero, um, we can always slice open this this the 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 path integral that we have by uh, you know you you pick any curve gamma that is homologous to R um, and you can then slice open the path integral along gamma by inserting uh, a complete set of states along gamma. Okay and. It's a general feature of path integrals, or um, uh, right, that the entanglement entropy um, of um, of the state that the Euclidean path integral creates uh, on this region R is going to be upper bounded by um, by the log uh, of the dimension of the Hilbert space on gamma. Okay, um, uh, the 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 log of the dimension of the Hilbert space on gamma. Uh, that's basically that uh, upper bounds the rank of the density matrix. Um, the dimension of the Hilbert space on gamma upper bounds the rank of the density matrix that you can get on R, and therefore the entanglement entropy is upper bounded by the log of the dimension of the Hilbert space on gamma. Okay, and this is true of any gamma. Now, in standard quantum field theories, this upper bound is not very useful uh, because this dimension of the Hilbert space on gamma tends to be infinite. Okay, um, but we are in a slightly better situation um, because the the TT bar deformed deformed field theory, um, in particular the TT bar deformation, acts as a natural regulator uh, for 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 this for this divergence, uh, and so that's what we want to show. We want to show that the TT bar deformed field theory has has a better behaved um, 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 has a better behave, uh, behaved behaved uh, dimension. Of the Hilbert space on cuts like this. Okay, so in order to do that, what we do is uh, you pick some arbitrary cut gamma, which is homologous to R, um, and you pick a tiny uh, tubular neighborhood of this cut gamma, which in this picture is, sh is shown by the the gray um, the gray tubular neighborhood that surrounds gamma. And in inside this tubular neighborhood, it's uh, you you pick some you pick adapted coordinate coordinates sigma naught and sigma one, these coordinates are adapted uh, to the curve gamma, such that the metric basically look, looks flat up to corrections from, from the extrinsic curvature of uh, this curve. Okay, now um, the, the, the proper length of the spatial coordinate sigma one is just, it, the sigma one is, is going from zero to L uh, of gamma, where L gamma is the length of this curve. Okay, so that's, the, the length of the curve is, is encoded in the, um, 
in the spatial coordinate or the extent of the spatial coordinate. And sigma naught, which is like the Euclidean time coordinate perpendicular to the curve, that um, the extent of that we will take to be much smaller um, than, than the extrinsic curvature of the curve um, so that uh, we don't see these corrections. Okay, so sigma naught uh, is some very tiny, infinitesimally small uh, interval around this curve so that we don't see extrinsic curvature corrections. Now, uh, so in, inside such a tiny Euclidean uh, tubular neighborhood, the metric looks flat. And so because the metric looks flat in this tiny um, tubular neighborhood, uh, we can approximate or, uh, the path integral of the field theory in this tubular neighborhood um, with just the flat space TT bar deformed field theory, um, but with this particular coupling. The coupling is a, is a scalar, it's a number. Um, so it doesn't change under changes of coordinates. Um, and so the coupling is what it is, but the background metric uh, inside this tubular neighborhood uh, will look flat. Okay. And so if we wanted to calculate uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space on the score of gamma, what we would do is we would take this tiny tubular neighborhood, uh, the gray, the gray uh, tubular neighborhood on this left picture, uh, which is, is a cylinder, right? And we would compactify the, the, the Euclidean time direction along sigma naught uh, into a circle of some length beta and then take this beta to zero, right? So what that is doing is the, the first of all, the spatial, um, the spatial length here is L gamma, the length of this curve. Uh, when you compactify the, the Euclidean time coordinate sigma naught, you're calculating um, trace of e to the minus beta h on this uh, so in the, on the spatial line. So you're calculating the thermal partition function. And then when you send beta to zero, um, that just calculates the dimension of the Hilbert space because trace of uh, one is the dimension of the Hilbert space. So one way of getting the dimension of the Hilbert space on gamma is to just calculate the, the thermal partition function on a cylinder of length L gamma um, with this TT bar coupling um, and then send beta to zero. Okay, so that's what we are going to do. So um, um, yeah. I, think, I think I have a, an objection to the idea that we can neglect the extrinsic curvature here. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe I'm not understanding what you're doing. But I, I did a similar calculation, and it seemed like the extrinsic curvature was quite important when you're calculating the junction conditions to go from one side to the other side. That is, that if I abruptly change my extrinsic curvature to zero, mm -hmm. then that's like a delta function of the Ricci scalar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because the uh, because that contributes to the Hamiltonian constraint, there can also be abrupt changes of things like the stress tensor and so on. Now, maybe you're going to tell me that that's not important because you're only interested in the dimension of the Hilbert space and not calculating any other observable. Um, when I did the calculation, it only seemed to make these entropy bounds stronger, not as long as you're staying in the Euclidean signature. So I, I, I think it, in the end, I'd come out agreeing with you, but I, I, I'm worried about this extrinsic curvature because I think it uh, does make a difference. Okay, thanks for that comment. What I, um, I, I, maybe we should discuss this at length a little bit later, but for now, let me just say that um, we can always take um, the, you see, since we are interested only, as you said, since we are only interested in the dimension of the Hilbert space, we want to take the we want to compactify the tubular neighborhood and send the this, the length of this time circle beta to zero. So in other words, we want to consider a, a, a tubular neighborhood around this cut, which is which is 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 going to zero in its extent along this perpendicular direction, and because the corrections enter with like k times sigma naught or the extent in the perpendicular direction. In that limit, we expect that the, those corrections are not important. Well, that, that's the argument that I don't believe because I think it, it, uh, you can show that there are in fact large contributions coming from the extrinsic curvature, order one. Oh. Okay, uh, great. So, 
but it may, I, I, but it may not affect your final conclusion. But I don't think you can get to the final conclusion by saying that K is negligible. I believe that's the wrong argument. I okay, believe great. the so, right argument will say that yeah. K makes a large effect, but as long as you stay in the right Hilbert space, you're still okay. That's great. So I, I would love to hear more about uh, the the calculation that you did and the, your arguments. Um, so maybe let me suggest that um, in view of the time, since I have five course, minutes, I, you should you should you should yeah. go proceed. Let yes. me just finish my uh, yeah. uh, discussion and let's come back to this at the end of the talk. So this is this is really important, but we should come back to it at the end. Okay, great. Thanks for that comment. Um, so if we if we for now believe that these extrinsic curvature contributions are small, um, and this is something we should come back to at the end, um, then we can calculate uh, the partition, the Euclidean partition function of the TT bar deformed theory on the cylinder um, as follows. Uh, so so, uh, th so in, the, in, this, in this approximation, then we, we are on a flat space cylinder with length L gamma and the time length beta going to zero. Um, so what we can do is we can write the partition function um, on the cylinder uh, by using a global uh, scale transformation like so. So instead of having length for the time circle beta, we take the length of the time circle to be one. Uh, the spatial length correspondingly gets rescaled with one over beta and the TT bar coupling also gets rescaled uh, with one over beta square because that's just this just follows from dimensional analysis. And in the lim limit that beta is going to zero, um, we can uh, effectively um, quantize the cylinder uh, by treating the, the compact direction as space, uh, because here in this presentation, the spatial circle has length one, but sorry, the, the compact circle has length one, but the, the other direction uh, has a length, which is L over beta. Since beta is going to zero, that length is becoming very large. Okay, the, the cylinder is becoming very uh, long and thin in this limit. Um, so we can quantize by taking the compact direction as space. Uh, and so this in that limit, the partition function basically becomes um, e to the minus um, L gamma over beta, uh, which is the, the length in the spatial, ex, spatial direction times uh, the vacuum energy. Okay, um, now, the nice thing about TT bar deformed field theories is that these vacuum energies, um, the, the vacuum energy at finite coupling is known. Okay, the vacuum energy at finite coupling is, is given by, um, by this formula, which was derived by um, Zamalogikov and collaborators. Um, I hope you remember this formula from the earlier part of the talk. Um, and so we take this formula and we take beta small, um, so that, uh, that is what uh, I've written out here. Uh, and just to mention this E naught is the vacuum energy in the original CFT, okay, of, on, on a spatial circle of length one. All right, so putting all of this together, um, what we, uh, we get is that the dimension of the Hilbert space uh, on the Scott gamma uh, is the beta going to zero limit of this uh, thermal partition function, and it ends up uh, giving you uh, this particular co combination. And then finally, you you go back to um, saying that th you, you see this TT bar coupling lambda is related to um, to to the to the radial uh, coordinate W, uh, and the central charge, of course, is related to G Newton using the standard brown hanaud formula. So you put put these two. Um, uh, values of the parameters in this formula. And what that reduces to is, uh, is that the log of dimension of H gamma becomes um, one over four G Newton times um, the length of the curve gamma. Um, e, so if you write it in terms of the length of gamma in the, the field theory metric, then you get a factor of one over WC out front, but you can also write it in terms of the length of gamma in, term, in the induced metric uh, G naught which you'll remember from our previous discussion was related to gamma like this. Uh, and then in that way of writing the log of the dimension of H gamma, the coefficient is just one over four G Newton. Okay. Um, so in, the, in this way of doing the computation, the, the log of the dimension of the Hilbert space on this cut ends up being finite and equal to one over four G Newton times the length 
uh, of the scut. But the scut was arbitrary. And remember that our starting point was, was, the, was the argument that the entanglement entropy of any boundary interval uh, should be upper bounded by the log of the dimension of H gamma. So by this argument, since if, if this argument is true of any gamma, um, then the entanglement entropy must be lower bounded or upper bounded by one over four G Newton times the minimal length of gamma, the, um, the gamma for which uh, the length of the curve in terms of the induced metric is minimal, okay? Um, now this, so this was, this was an argument for a folded slice like this. Uh, so the minimal curve there would look like this dotted red line. As the, um, as the folded slice approaches the time reflection symmetric slice, um, the, this minimal length cut approaches uh, the, what we, will, we would call the true, the, the true Ryu Takenagi surface, okay? The true, the true minimal surface from the bulk perspective. Um, and that happens in the limit that we send WC to one, or this folded um, Euclidean path integral approaches um, the bulk time reflection symmetric slice. Okay, so that is the, uh, that, uh, is the argument for why the entanglement entropy uh, satisfies um, uh, an upper bound, uh, which is reminiscent of the Ryu Takenagi formula. Um, now I'm uh, almost uh, at the end of my time. Uh, in the rest of the talk, what I wanted, so maybe I can just take a couple of minutes to briefly go over um, the next few slides. Um, in the rest of the talk, what I wanted to tell you um, about is, is that going beyond this inequality. So this, this was just an upper bound on the entropy. You know, we can also sort of make some comments going beyond the inequality and say something about the actual entanglement entropy of boundary intervals for these networks. The simplest way to do that is to just use um, the holographic RT formula. Um, now, since we are in a time reflection symmetric slice setup, as I said, the true Ryu Takenagi surface in the bulk is going to lie on, on, the, on the time reflection symmetric slice. Okay. Um, so, so in other words, if I if I decide to use the holographic RT formula to calculate the entanglement entropy of a boundary interval, this green interval here, in the in this folded field theory, okay, the the TT bar deformed field theory living on this folded slice, I can use um, the Ryu Takenagi formula uh, in the bulk to do that, since the Ryu Takenagi surface is on the time reflection symmetric slice, it doesn't really depend on how much I fold um, the boundary Euclidean path integral into the bulk. It doesn't depend on the value of WC, okay? So in other words, the, the large N entanglement entropy of a boundary interval is, is independent of WC, okay? It's just given by one over four G Newton times the minimal length um, on the time reflection symmetric slice. Uh, here G star denotes the metric, the induced metric on the time reflection symmetric slice. Okay, so that remains unchanged under these deformations. Uh, so what's the what's the the picture here? The the picture for the entropy is is as follows: um, as we flow in this WC direction, okay, as we fold the the boundary Euclidean path integral into the bulk, um, the large n entropy of a boundary interval stays constant. Okay, um, however, the 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 upper bound that we obtain, the minimal cut upper bound on the entropy, uh, that becomes smaller and smaller because remember the upper bound at any given value of WC is given by the minimal area uh, surface, minimal length surface on that um, on that particular Cauchy slice or the, on that particular bulk slice at uh, that value of WC. Uh, so that's this dotted um, the dotted curve here. Okay, so as the parameter WC becomes closer and closer to one, so in other words, as this folding slice gets closer and closer to the time reflection symmetric slice, this upper bound uh, gets closer and closer to the true value of the entropy. Um, that is, that is the, the length of the Ryu Takenagi surface. Okay, and as WC approaches one, the entropy, um, 
saturates or the the, up, the, the, the upper bound um, that you get from the tensor network is saturated in that limit. Uh, and because that bound came from the rank of the density matrix, it must be that at least up to one over n corrections, the entanglement spectrum is becoming flat uh, in that limit, in the limit WC going to one. So these were sort of um, holographic arguments. Now, um, we also have some field theory arguments for why this should be true. But um, since I'm really out of time here, I'm going to um, sort of skip them. You can find the field theory arguments for why, um, for why this picture uh, is the right one uh, in, in the paper. So I'll, uh, in, in lieu of time, I'm going to jump ahead um, to uh, my summary. There we go. So um, what we, we've done here is that we've um, assigned um, we've assigned tensor networks or um, Euclidean path undergrowths, which you can think in terms of tensor networks uh, to um, these hyperbolic slices um, in the bulk geometry. Um, the, the value of the radial coordinate W uh, at which this hyperbolic slice lives is related to the TT bar coupling uh, of, the, of the field theory in, in the dual Euclidean path integral uh, and the background metric on this folded slice is, or the induced metric on this folded slice is the background metric for this, um, for this field theory. Um, so this is what I just said. These, these networks have a more or less precise description in terms of Euclidean path integrals in this TT bar deformed field theory. We've given an argument uh, that these, these Euclidean path integrals or, or tensor networks satisfy a Ryu Takenagi like upper bound um, where uh, the entanglement entropies, uh, uh, sorry, where the, the log of the bond dimension is given by one over four G Newton. That comes from uh, doing a calculation in the TT bar uh, deformed field theory. Um, and I, I should again emphasize that these networks are not preparing the vacuum of the dual CFT. They're preparing some other states, but these states have the same large N entanglement structure as that of the CFT vacuum. And so this, the large end entanglement entropy of these, uh, these network states is the same uh, as that of the dual CFT. And so uh, uh, one last thing is to let me just uh, say some uh, things which I think are important questions to answer uh, and understand. Um, can we, so one, one thing is, can we understand the one over four G Newton bound at a deeper level? whether this way of thinking about this, um, um, the, whether this way of thinking about one over four G Newton as the log of the bond dimension and some TT bar deformed path integral uh, gives us a better understanding um, of this bound or not, um, of, 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 of one over four G Newton or not. Um, go, even going beyond large N, can we include uh, quantum corrections in this calculation? Um, or even at large n, can we um, um, uh, can we uh, do a, a more precise calculation to extract um, these entanglement entropies? Um, can we extend our construction to Cauchy slices in Lorentzian signature? So much of what I said in this talk was all uh, about Euclidean signature, uh, but it's uh, an equally interesting question to assign tensor network interpretations to slices in the Lorentzian signature. Uh, and finally, if, if, that, um, if that works, then can, we, can this construction shed some light on the complexity equals volume correspondence uh, in particular, since we have, uh, if, if, since, we, since this gives some roadmap towards a tensor network uh, construction, one could hope that that um, leads to some um, progress on the complexity equals volume or action uh, conjectures. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Onkar. Uh, we had some questions already, but we still have time for some more. Yeah. So please go ahead. Onkar, this is Ted. Yeah, um, hi, Ted. When, hi, thanks for the very interesting talk. When you introduced the W coordinate, I didn't really quite follow whether it had a sort of geometrically intrinsic meaning or not, which led me to be uncomfortable 
with the identification of the TT bar coupling and a particular value of that coordinate. So I just sort of missed why this is an intrinsic uh, identification. Um, that's, uh, that's a good uh, point. Uh, one way to think about this W coordinate is in terms of, um, of this York time. It's um, one, one, one slices the bulk geometry using sort of um, uh, constant extrinsic curvature slices. And then the value of the extrinsic curvature is, um, is uh, what you could call the W coordinate. Um, so I was, for the most part, working in just ADS3, and so I didn't um, explain it in those terms. But uh, I, I would think that in more general geometries, you could use the York time slicing and then write a Pfefferman gram like metric in, in, in that slicing. And then the, 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 the trace of the extrinsic curvature in that slicing would be the, the analog of the W, w coordinate. Uh, does that uh, does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, that, that helps. Thank you. Maybe if I could say something that I think Please is true, might be helpful is um, to get an arbitrary slice, you could presumably do that with a position dependent TT bar deformation. But because it's the only dimension full parameter in the theory, you could probably morally trade that for a TT bar deformation on a, uh, on a different geometry slice. Yes, yes, that's true. Um, so um, to say, say that slightly differently, well, yeah, to say that slightly differently, these the TT bar deformed field theories have um, this property that their partition functions actually depend only on the ratio of the induced metric times or divided by square root of lambda or some, some dimensional uh, less ratio like that. And so you can sort of trade between overall conformal factors in the metric and uh, position dependent TT bar couplings and so on. Um, I think that's what Aaron was trying to say, but um, in, in our case, since we were just interested in ADS3, we didn't have to do that, but in more complicated geometries where uh, one, one could presumably uh, imagine doing that, uh, I agree. I have a question. Uh, uh, yeah. You said that the states we are generating by these uh, patent because are the pattern states of the TT bar theories and not the CFT. Uh, how different is are these states from the CFT vacuum actually? Um, so as I said, they're um, they're uh, okay. So um, let me see. Um, they have the same large n entropies. Um, uh, for example, if we include order one contributions to the entanglement entropy, I suspect that they will be different. Um, now, you could ask, what is the relation between, uh, how do I relate the vacuum, say the vacuum state and the dual CFT to, to these states, to, to something in the, in the folded Hilbert space? Um, one way to do that is to, um, to, to argue that, uh, let me go to some picture here. Yeah, there we go. So one way to do that is to argue that um, you see the partition function of the vacuum state on this asymptotic slice uh, is related to the, to the partition function on this folded slice uh, via the bulk path integral in this orange region. Okay, the, the regions, I hope you can see the, uh, the yeah. yeah. So the, the orange region here, um, that's, so if you, if you, perform the bulk path integral in this orange region with some fixed with um, with some fixed metric on the asymptotic slice and some other metric gamma let's say on this folded slice and then you integrate over gamma uh, then that uh, give that is a relation that gives a relation between the asymptotic partition function and the partition functions at, on the folded slices um, but with some arbitrary metric gamma on the folded slice, okay? So that gives a, so if you think that through a little bit, what you, you might end up concluding or you end up concluding is that at least for correlation functions of uh, a small number of operators, like not a large number, of, not scaling with N or anything, but correlation functions of a small number of operators, the boundary CFT vacuum can be thought of 
as a superposition um, of states in the folded Hilbert space or in the TT bar deformed Hilbert space, um, where uh, where uh, the, the superposition is over these Euclidean path integral states in the TT bar deformed Hilbert space um, with arbitrary metric gamma. Um, on the uh, on these on these states, and the, the the coefficient of the superposition is sort of the Hartle-Hawking wave function. Um, in 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 the you know the the bulk path integral in this orange region down here with some fixed metric gamma on the folded slice, um, and the vacuum boundary conditions are the asymptotic slice. So that maybe that's one way of answering your question, which is to say that um, the vacuum state in the asymptotic at the asymptotic slice is related to uh, states in this folded Hilbert space via some superpositions where the coefficients are Hartle Hawking wave functions. Okay, thanks. That I hope I sorry about the ex the extended uh, response, but I hope that helps a little. So another question, which may be related to the issue of Lorentzian signature, well, I think this is um, I think you're implicitly assuming here that with the TT bar spectrum, so TT bar spectrum has a branch cut. And when you talk about the dimension of the Hilbert space, you're implicitly assuming that we're truncating the spectrum to remove the energies that are complex. That's right. So that's a great question. Um, we didn't have to explicitly assume that because we were just, uh, calculating this thermal partition function and in the limit beta going to zero, it just picked out the vacuum energy. Right, so I wonder if it's somehow implicit in beta equals zero. I feel like what's going on is that beta equals zero is taking you, to, uh, if you think about the, the it's the, if you think about it the micro canonical way, instead of a canonical way, that mm -hmm. I think it's pushing you to the, the branch cut of the spectrum. Yes. Right, that's right. So you're that's that's right. You're going closer and closer to the to the to the branch cut of the spectrum. That's right. Um, um, but the in the large n limit, it's sort of picking out just the contribution from those states. Like the the state those are the states which sort of dominate the ensemble um, in the large n limit, and it's just picking out a con the the contribution of those states um, which dominate the ensemble. Now. I don't think that that amounts to saying that we are truncating the spectrum. It's just that those states dominate the ensemble in the large n limit. Um, but um, well, uh, why why would they dominate if I'm thinking? Sorry, if I'm thinking, uh, if I calculate e to the minus beta h, if I have yes. a whole bunch of states that have the same real part of h, then I guess I have an oscillatory contribution from no. The um, right. So if you, what, what happens is that if you look at the, um, the, the, the density, the energy, the spectral density, um, in, uh, in these TT bar deformed field theories, then it sort of, uh, has a peak. It, um, has a maximum, um, just at the point where the branch cut begins. So I, th I think, I think if you, I think it actually is like more like a saddle point. Where if you if you start going off in the imaginary direction, the density of states actually continues to increase. Um, in the imaginary directions, that's probably yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. um, right. Um, um, right. So I believe uh, right. I'll just lay my cards on the table. So I'm writing a paper about this right now. I okay. believe that to understand Lorentzian signature, it's going to be necessary to open our hearts to these imaginary energy eigenvalues and accept mm -hmm. their existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's that interesting. Is, I, th okay. I think if you have a Cauchy slice that goes into Lorentzian signature, that's precisely the extrinsic curve that the ADM momentum becomes time-like, which is imaginary from the perspective of somebody who likes Euclidean field theory. And I, I think that's signaling that uh, you're, you're, the state is peaked around these imaginary energy eigenvalues. I see, That's that sounds very interesting. Um, one, yeah, I, uh, one comment is that when you flow into the Lorenzian signature, you also have to modify your TT bar flow a little bit, right? 
because um, um, as you as you as you flow into the Lorenzian signature, I think the sign of the Ricci scalar or something like this, the Ricci scalar term or something like this changes. Um, okay, let me say it this way: Is it clear that the flow in the Lorenzian signature is not is is uh, is 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 not the is not different from the one in the Euclidean signature. I think the original flow works formally, whereby formally I mean you're willing to just analytically continue past the branch cut. I mean, there's some conventions. There's some differences of conventions between Lorenzi and Euclidean signature. Right. We should be interested in that. Right. Okay. So uh, fine. That that's a very interesting comment. In in our all I can say is that in our calculation, we we never seem to have uh, at least explicitly encountered these imaginary eigenvalues. As you say, maybe implicitly there is some assumption in there which needs to be teased out. But explicitly, it seems like we're just calculating this thermal partition function in the beta going to zero limit, and it just sort of cares about the the way the vacuum energy flows uh, for a C, for a CFT for for the field theory on a circle. Okay. Uh, I, I also wanted to hear a little bit more about your previous comments on the dependence on the extrinsic curvature, but perhaps, but maybe it would be easy for us to exchange other, this. Other people ask any questions they have, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they don't have other questions. Well, then, if there are no further official questions, uh, let's thank uh, Onkar again. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me. Thank you very much.